Welcome to Dissertating and Defending During the Pandemic, sponsored by the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice. The Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice, or the Proctor Institute, as we love to call it, is a national center that focuses on issues of leadership, equity, and justice within the context of higher education. It brings together researchers, practitioners, and community members to work toward the common goals of diversifying leadership, enhancing equity, and fostering justice for all. The Proctor Institute is located at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, in the Graduate School of Education and houses the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions, CMSI. For more information about the Proctor Institute, please visit https colon backslash backslash proctor.gsc.rutgers.edu. My name is Tanisha Williams, and I have the honor of serving as tonight's panel moderator. This evening's discussion will offer current doctoral students and candidates tangible approaches to persisting through the COVID-19 pandemic. Panelists will share personal stories and tips for defending the dissertation in the virtual space and how to remain motivated during that doctoral journey. So I must say that I've spoken to all of our amazing panelists and they are nothing shy of amazing. So I am gonna turn it over to them to give you a introduction of who they are and what they work on and a little taste of why they're so awesome. Tracy, hey, I think right? first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hi, uh, I'm Tracy Freiberg. Uh, I think on the flyer it says I'm a visiting professor of economics at St. John's University, so that's my full-time job and they give me health insurance and stuff, so that's cool. Uh, quick background, I'm from Wisconsin. I have a background in economics. My PhD is in public and urban policy. Uh, my research deals with paid family leave and studying how businesses respond to paid family leave policies and mandated benefits and that sort of stuff. Uh, I have a defense date of October 6th, so it's really, really soon. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Sergio, my dear. Hi, everybody. I'm Sergio or Sergio. Either works for me. My pronouns are el, he, him. I'm currently a doctoral candidate at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. So like 40, 45 minutes east of L.A. Um, I live in L.A., but I'm from the Bay Area, born and raised. Um, so I always rep NorCal. <laughs> um, a little bit about me. I do a lot of research on Joteria pedagogy. So like queer pedagogy, but queer folks of color. And I really focus on queer and Latinx students. Um, and right now, my dissertation, I'm focusing on what it means to be queer and Latinx as a graduate student and really diving into it with Joteria pedagogy and co-creating with folks. So that's a little about me. Thank you so much. Augusta. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here today. I'm excited to have this conversation with folks. I'm Augusta Irele. Um, I defended in December my dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania in uh, the departments of African Africana Studies and Comparative Literature and Literary Theory. Um, and my research really focuses on contemporary uh, narratives of migration and transnationalism from Africa, in Africa, right, um, but also in the United States and Europe. And so right now I am a president's postdoctoral fellow at The Ohio State University. Can't forget the V, right? The Ohio State University <laughs> um, in Columbus, Ohio. I'm from Columbus. Uh, also, I'm sort of from Boston. Long story, I'll talk about it later, maybe. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Bianca, I think you're up next. Yes, well, thank you so much. So my name is Bianca and I attend St. Edwards University, a Hispanic serving institution in Austin, Texas. I too, and well, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. Uh, my research focuses on Latinas in higher education. Um, I noticed the gap in guidance for Latinas navigating the academic train into the professorate and really became passionate about that. Um, when I'm not in school, I work as a professional working with um, government agencies, nonprofits, corporations across the country. Thank you. And Tapello, my dear, please. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is, so thank you. My name is Tapello Newby Whitfield. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Iowa in the Educational Measurement and Statistics Department. Um, I should be defending in the next couple months or so and graduating. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, as the flyer said, I'm the vice president of Math Values, which is a nonprofit that offers free 30 minute virtual tutoring for students, uh, math, math tutoring for students in the K through 12. 
area and my dissertation is um, a validation study of a campus climate survey. So my focus has been assessment in higher education. All right, thank you so much. So as you can see, we are filled to the brim with some excellence and I don't wanna waste any time. I want us to jump right in, but I do wanna start with some with some interesting statistics to ground our conversation. Our conversation. So first things first, from 2018 to 2019, there were 188,000 doctoral, doctoral, how do I say this, doctoral degrees awarded. Um, but what happened after the pandemic is that some of those statistics drastically in decreased. So let me tell you a little bit about, about what happened. There are two most frequently cited reasons for the cancellation of going to schools, and most of those pertained to effects of the coronavirus. So 46% of the folks who are going to matriculate into schools said that they had huge concerns with being impacted or infected by the virus. Then we had a smattering of different reasons from curiosities around where the money would come from, curiosities around how colleges would iterate their programs, curiosities around how financial aid would play itself out. And then there were a substantial number of folks who still thought through how they could care for their families and matriculate through programs. So I say all that to say, um, I think the majority of us on this panel entered into our doctoral programs before the pandemic hit. And we were in it. We Most of us were in the thick of it. And then this thing happened to the entire world. So folks were faced with decisions on how they would continue. So what we thought we would do today is really break down parts of that PhD process and, and have, have a little discussion about what it takes to get through the writing, what it takes to get through the defense, what it takes when you start looking for a job, and then hopefully end up with some, some tips and takeaways from our amazing panelists. So I've sorted this into rounds for us and our first round pertains to the writing process. So I'm gonna just jump right in. For those of you who may not be in PhD programs, spoiler alert, there's writing. <laughs> Doesn't matter what kind of doctoral program you're in, there will be some writing. So when we think about the writing process, I would love for all of our panelists to really talk us through what does your process look like? What can we learn from the best of your practice? And if you are a writer or if you aren't a writer, how do you keep yourself kind of amped up to get through the masses, um, massive amounts of writing that occur? And we can really go in any order, you guys. This is totally informal, so let's just share it out. I'll go first. Uh, so uh, I've... I think I forgot to mention I was at the new school. I'm at the Milano School of Public and Urban Policy with Tanisha, so that seems like a, a fail on my part. That's why you, I guess you don't invite your friends to this, Tanisha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so at Milano, and I guess in every PhD program is a little bit different, right? So at Milano, you had to have a master's before you started the PhD program. So it's very normal that everybody had a full-time job going into the program. I actually had a different full-time job when I started. I was an insurance underwriter, which is very different from teaching economics. Uh, but I had finished all of our coursework before the pandemic, and I actually, uh, I think because policy is like applied economics for me, uh, I've, I've written three different versions of my proposal. The first one just didn't sound like me. It sounded like economics, Tracy, from like 10 years ago when I was at Duke, and I said, no, this doesn't sound like me, and uh, I defended my dissertation proposal on March 12th of 2020, so... We did the whole, uh, I was going to do a survey of employees and the employers and ask just kind of if the, what kind of paid leave benefits were in place, what the sentiment was around them kind of stuff. And we basically got to the end of it. And my committee said, uh, let's table this for a couple of weeks and see what happens with this COVID thing. And three weeks later, they're like, yeah, you absolutely cannot interview people about their benefits during a pandemic because some people are losing their jobs. So I said, okay went back to the drawing board. Uh, so a lot of it was a literature review, right? So I wanted to keep the methodology tool and I ended up coming with a new survey and I just empl uh, surveyed employers. Uh, but for the writing part of it, uh, because I had three different versions, the literature review didn't really change too much. It was mandated benefits and what happens with those. I actually got my lit review published as a peer reviewed journal article, which was kind of a luck of the draw thing from being at St. John's. They just happened to need something. So it forced me 
to get that done under a timeline. And I got two people to read it that have written a lot. So that was really great. Uh, and then I think since I've changed everything, uh, we've had formalized writing groups at the new school. So it's like accountability groups where a small group of us check in on Zoom and we kind of share out what we're gonna work on that day and we work on it. And the other part was I teach four classes a semester and I don't have a teaching assistant. So I have something like uh, at, at most 150 students a semester. So uh, I get a lot of writing done in the break time, which means I go back to my parents' house and my mom makes me food and I get a bunch of stuff done and I keep my little accountability group. So that's kind of how writing goes for me. Plus these like finding groups of people that you can share your writing with and they can give you feedback. I think that's been really helpful for me as well. I would say uh, figure out what your, how you like to write. I feel like uh, preparing for my dissertation, most people told me to like do things in little chunks at a time, which probably works for a lot of people. Um, so I tried that and I realized that I actually work better when I have these like large chunks of time and just like write, whether that be um, saying, okay, I'm going to afford this next week. I'm just going to like go away, like go visit my brother or go somewhere else and like write a big chunk of my dissertation. And I find that that's when I've been most productive. So although people may give you tips, figure out what really works for you and stick with that. So that'll be like a big piece of advice I would give everybody. The thing yeah. that I would add to that, sorry, Sergio, do you want to? No, no, go for it. Um, the thing that I would add to that is find when works for you. Um, a lot of my friends in my cohort were morning people. I am just in general anti-morning as a concept and a time of day. <laughs> and so for me, what worked best was writing really between the hours of like one and five. And so I had to structure the rest of my day to make sure that that's what worked for me because that's when my brain was working. That's when I felt like I could get kind of things flowing. Um, and then I had a dedicated writing space in my apartment, which was my desk where I sat and I wrote. Uh, what I did during the pandemic was discover the magic of having a second monitor, which really just changes the whole game, really, particularly when we're, you know, reading. Now my articles were all vir vir virtual, excuse me. So, you know, I was reading ebooks, I was reading PDFs a lot more often than I was doing um, before the pandemic. And so I needed kind of that organizational space and room to be able to have more, right? Uh, more space to read and, and to then turn to another screen and then write or copy and paste some, some quotes. And so those were kind of two things that worked, that worked for me. Um, Process-wise though, it, you know, it involves a lot of tea, a lot of scribbling on a notepad and then kind of going to my Microsoft Word file, taking some chunks, um, right? And moving to other parts and moving to other files. Never, 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 never deleting anything. I have fragment documentations for every chapter, everything that I write, um, because sometimes you pull that back in. And a lot of the things that you pull out of the individual chapters actually, or that I pulled out of the individual, individual chapters ended up in either my conclusion or my introduction. I think for me, um, I write and read typically every day, but I do try to take Sundays off or Monday evenings um, because I have a really intense week. Um, and what I try to do, I, I found that for me, uh, in order to write, I, I need to read a lot because for some reason when I read, I kind of react and I respond. And so then I have original thoughts. Um, and so it's easier to read that way instead of just coming to a blank page and being like, okay, what am I going to write? Um, and so those are just some helpful tips for me. But then also I started mind mapping and I'm a very visual person. And especially when you're um, writing a lot, it's e for me, it's easier to mind map and see the connections and then write um, instead of um, seeing just the text on the page. Yeah, and just to, just to add to that, um, I'm also a visual like learner. Like I have to like engage or like I have to be like in stuff to like really learn, right? Like you can read something and sometimes it just doesn't click. Um, so I'm big on post-its and I put it on the wall. And so what I've done, like there's a, like Augusta was mentioning, like having a dedicated space is super key, I think, because for like when this panorama started, also I use P words instead of um, pandemic. So I use like anything, anything with a P word. So feel free to dive into that. But <laughs> I noticed that because my office was in my bedroom, it was like really triggering like my ADHD. So like I had really bad insomnia, like I couldn't focus because 
where I worked was where I slept. So my mind was like, well, the computer's right there and you have all this work to do and you're like hella behind. And all these like thoughts kept racing, right? Um, so I say that because A, the, I think the writing process is a hot mess. And I say that like with love and care because that's how it starts. Like there's moments when I'm sitting on like a word document and I'm just like, I can't get the words out. Like I know, I think I know what I wanna say or like when I talk to somebody and I'm like, you know, chismeando or gossiping, I'm like, I know what to say, <laughs> but the moment it becomes academic where I have to sit and like write this out, it's like deer in headlights, right? And so like embrace the hot mess that comes with this writing process, right? What you write the first time isn't going to be the best thing all the time, right? Some people are super gifted and talented and can write it like on the swing. I'm not that person. Um, and so post-its help me. Like when I'm doing something, sometimes I'll get a thought for something else. I'll write it on the post-it. I post it to the wall. And then later I go back and I organize it. And then I put it into like whatever organizations, you know, system I have to so like a Google Doc or something to save it. Um, and then I really like uh, echoing the aspect of community or comunidad, as I like to call it. Um, I find myself to be more accountable to people and not institutions for a lot of reasons, right? And um, and I mean, I think a lot of folks can agree, right? Like the institutions aren't really there to support us, <laughs> especially folks of color in these spaces, right? And so being accountable to people that you trust that you can be in solidarity with, right? Sometimes you just need to be in a virtual space with someone that's like, you don't even have to tell me, I get it. It's a hot mess. Now let's process together and let's see what we can come up with. So that's what I would say. I don't know how you guys left me to go after Sergio and <laughs> the analogy of the hot mess, but I'm, I'm just gonna go back through and give some highlights. Uh, so one thing we heard from Tracy is that she got her lit review published. So that is a thing. If you have the ability to write and think through like what what can this draft because our writing is always a draft right what can this draft later be used for um that's super helpful we heard about accountability groups both from tracy and sergio and this notion of of, of getting a crew and writing with a crew uh we also heard from a few folks scheduling your break scheduling the times when you're going to write if you're a morning person as we heard from dr augusta or if you have these long breaks that you can benefit from, as we heard from Tapello, definitely kind of putting a stamp on that time that you're going to write seems to be super, super helpful. Um, let's see. Oh, the finding what works for you. That is so much easier said than done. But I, I just want to echo the sentiments of like, what's you is for you. And you are the writer that you are going to be. And if that means that you have to have a cup of tea and have on Ugg boots with it super cold in the room, then you, you just gotta live your best life. But know that it takes a minute for you to figure that out. Um, and you figure that out after you've written something and it's like, oh, that's what I wanted and how I wanted to say. Then take that time to think about the conditions that were in existence when you hit it out of the park and see if you can duplicate it. Let's see what else. We had this notion of writing daily, mind mapping. Oh, visualizing with post-its or mind maps. So I'm sorry. I just, I felt like I couldn't give a real answer because y'all gave them all. But thank you so much for that. Um, let's move into the research process. So Tracy, you kind of, you, you, you buried the lead, boo. You already told the people that you had to change. But we practiced this, Tracy. You were supposed to hold that part of the story till round two, but it's okay. You, you've given some of it. But I really want us to think through during this pandemic, if and how our research processes maybe, maybe necessitated a pivot, right? So I would love for you guys to share out how you were able to successfully demonstrate that malleability um, during during times when you had no control over stuff. Tracy, I know that you're a quant person. Sergio, I know that you're a qual, you're a qual person. So I'd really love to hear from the two of you on some of the things that you did. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll jump in first. And uh, I, I don't, I can't really split the research from the writing, which is why I don't. So <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I made this pivot and Tanisha keeps calling me a quant person but I hope nev nobody ever calls me out on that because I would have to pull out my stats book and like oh I'll get back to you tomorrow and I can like <laughs> reteach myself how to do it but that's very uh, quant <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah so for me I kind of like 
talked about and in the in the first one I wrote the one that didn't sound like me I basically uh, I mean I think some of the feedback you get when you're trying to write your research question and figure out what research you want to do is like oh read what's out there right so there was a study by like a very prolific writer in the paid family leave space from the University of Virginia and I was like oh he's doing difference and differences and it's highly cited and I could totally do something like this it has census data I'll deal with that later right uh, but then I actually got to the writing the proposal part, which a lot of it is, you know, like, what are you actually going to do? And it's just like, oh, well, it doesn't really sound like me. It sounds like an economist, even though I kind of have one, right? <laughs> uh, but so I, did, I just, I did more reading and then I, uh, I changed com my committee members a little bit. So uh, I got a committee member who's in public health and he was like, you know, even though what we do is very different, the methodology, it sounds like you just need to ask employers why you don't have a paid po leave policy or uh, why is your policy the way it is, right? So I said, oh yeah, if you just flat out ask them, that's a great way to go about it. Uh, and yeah, and so that has worked for me, but again, I think it kind of hits on the same things that work for me with writing. It's talking to people who have done this before and can give you advice and reading a lot of what's out there and then also figuring out what, what's not out there, right? It's like, oh, this seems like a no brainer. Why hasn't anyone done this before? That's real. I think for, um, for me, uh, I say this a lot. I think we're at a point where the personal is political and what we've been you know, in dealing with, engaging with, you know, like just having to navigate and what I like to call academia or academia is that we need to find spaces and places that are like going to help nurture us, right? And so I don't know if it's successful, like how I successfully pivoted my research per se, but I think along the way, as a first gen doc student, I was like learning while I'm doing, right? So I'm getting like tips here and there from folks that are like, hey, by the way, here's something I would recommend you do because it's gonna save you time or it's gonna save you a headache in the future, right? And so somebody, you know, whispered in my ear, you should do a pilot study of what you want to do. That way you can like hands-on and I'm very like hands-on, like if I'm engaging with the material practicing, I know what to do for when the time comes, right? So I did a pilot study to help inform my dissertation and I did a pilot study with undergrad students and I actually ended up publishing it with the center, which is really dope because they, you know, they really worked with me to make sure that it didn't become I don't want to, this is like really rude, too academic-ish, where it's like you lose the essence of what this work is, right? And I, I was really like, I want to put this somewhere, A, that is open access so that folks can read this anywhere, right, without having to have a subscription, like a paywall or something. I wanted to, I wanted it to be from like my voice, where it's like you can hear and see me and my co-creators in this process and how we're like, you know, developing and creating practice, theory, praxis, and all that stuff. And so that really helped me. And I actually started my, I did my pilot study literally right when the panorama started. So I was having platicas, that was like my approach with some students in person. And then it was like, everything's closed. So I had to like revert and all of a sudden go into Zoom which actually worked out better than I thought, right? In that aspect, because people were more willing to be like, oh, I'll meet with you because we just have to meet on the computer mm -hmm. as opposed to having to meet in person. So that helped me a lot. And I'll, I'll add to that one benefit because uh, a huge chunk of my research, uh, well, all of my research was supposed to be in person. But when, when I pivoted to Zoom, I no longer had to um, worry about food and gift cards <laughs> and incentivizing the folks. So that was great. But uh, yeah, I, I concur. I, I had to make a, a huge pivot um, from what were supposed to be school-based observations to kind of looking at Zoom recordings of professional development after it happened. And um, I, I just had to give myself that grace and make it happen and kind of iterate, iterate the way that I wrote my questions a bit to kind of make it fit. So thank you guys both for that. I think one thing, um, one kind of through line that we can pull out of both of your stories is that they, you may have to pivot. There may not be a panorama or a pandemic or a thing, but I'm sure that there are tons of iterations where either you, you can't have access to the, the research that you thought that you would have access to or a site falls through. So there is this notion of, of, 
of being able to pivot, but that's all part of the process, I think. And I think it totally makes us stronger. So let's move into what is like defending, defending once, defending twice, what is the job market, and then how we get into postdocs. Because I did not mention, but we do want to make sure we leave questions for you guys at the end. Not yet that though. Right now you're still absorbing, but there will come a time when you can drop your questions in the chat. So let's talk a little bit about the proposal. Bianca, I want to turn to you for um, all things proposal, because I know that you're a working professional. Uh, so you're working full time and you're also in a doctoral program, but you also have to go through this. Kind of, I think they look at it as like the first kind of hurdle. And in some instances, folks have said the proposal is the most difficult. So talk us through like your, your proposal defense. Yes, you know, I was I was unsure if I was going to share this story or not, but um, I actually had a chair, kind of a last minute chair change. And initially I was very, let's just say I was in my nicest way. I just was not prepared for that. Um, and so I was, you know, I was just um, very emotional about it. But then I thought, you know what? I, thankfully, I really have a very supportive cohort. I have a supportive, I'm at a supportive school. And I really thought, you know what, I believe that these, um, that, that this change is for the good. And honestly, it was for the good. Um, the person that um, is my chair has both quant and qual background, which is definitely my, um, you know, I want to do uh, mixed methods research. Um, and so in sharing sharing the vision in regards to like, this is what I would like, you know, this is what I'm working on. This is what I've done. Um, some of the previous work, um, it actually, it was amazing, honestly. It was just simply amazing that I was able to uh, work with this professor, um, this proposal process. Um, the way our program works is we keep building and building and building and building. And so we, thankfully, um, when I was able to meet um, with my chair, it was not like, um, I was presenting something for the first time. It was something that had been built up over time so that there was, um, I guess there was some, uh, I don't even know the right word. It was just, it worked out really well. Um, and, and in regards to balancing as a professional, I think, you know, I've been having to do <laughs> days and nights. Uh, there's no break, but um, I think we talked about off, off, the, off the call, uh, we talked about like commitment um, and I think the word is like, you know, it's endurance. And so I'm like, okay, I built up the endurance. Um, I'm, I'm committed to it. I'm, I'm planning to endure and I work my life around it to be able to endure um, and, and shift um, every day. You know, I shift twice a day uh, from professional to student. Um, and I go back and forth. Um, but I think that's part of uh, being able to manage it. That's kind of something that's been able to help me along the way so much for that and thank you for deciding to share that part of your story with us we appreciate it because it happens sometimes you have to make some pivots and some changes and you have to be all right with that yeah. so thank you so much um let's move into then what is that dissertation proposal defense so you i'm sorry your dissertation defense so you have your proposal defense that comes first after your comps after your classes you defend your proposal <laughs> And then you're, you're, you're really going to write this thing, right? And, and you write this thing, and then you have to defend it. So Dr. Augusta, I want to go to you because um, you've done that thing. <laughs> and I guess I want to ask specifically <laughs> about the, like, you spent all this time working on this stuff. And one, you did it virtually. So I would love to hear how that virtual defense went down. But then I also just want to hear, I would love for you to make some comparisons for us. Were you as nervous with the, with the dissertation defense as you were with the proposal defense? Just break it down for us. How'd that thing go? Yeah, all good questions. Sometimes, you know, I have these days sometimes when I wake up and I'm like, wow, I really did defend my dissertation in the middle of a pandemic. It's wild. Um, so a few things. My proposal defense, at least in my two departments at Penn, were not, they, it didn't require me to have a public proposal defense. It was just me and my committee talking through my proposal. Um, like a lot of folks on this panel, my committee shifted over the time. So the committee that I defended my dissertation to is different than who I had uh, defended my proposal to. By the time I got to, you know, pand pandemic, 
there are a lot of things that drive you through the dissertation. And I, you know, some folks on, on social media will tell you a lot that by the time you get to the end of it, a lot of it is spiked and just kind of pushing through, right? And just making sure that you're finishing because you've gotten so far. And I think the pandemic really highlighted for me, you know, it affected a few folks in my family and kind of in my orbit. And so highlighted for me the importance of doing this thing, right? Because there had been so much just personal and all kinds of other right community issues that were happening at the same time that this felt really important because it felt like a communal effort. So the beautiful thing about my virtual defense is that I was able to invite my community. First, I tried to do a private defense, but that's against Penn's rules. So <laughs> then I said, all right, let me do this and let me just fill it up with my friends and my family, right? And folks who, you know, like I have an uncle who, um, lives all the way in Nigeria who was able to join friends who were in you know Boston and all these other places who if I had had an in-person defense it would not have been as possible to engage in this way with them and so it ended up being um, honestly really beautiful and I'm glad I got the opportunity to have a virtual defense uh, for two reasons one I think what Sergio said earlier about these institutions are not built for us and so sometimes we have to show them who we are and who is behind us and who is pushing us. And my virtual defense allowed me to do that. Uh, and, and folks commented on how they'd never seen, you know, that combination of folks in a defense before. Um, and then two, it allowed me to share my work, right, with the folks who I cared about, um, with friends who had known me for a really long time, folks who'd known me in high school, in college, right, and, and beyond. And my mom, right, and my sisters and uncles and so and cousins, right, and like folks who, as I said earlier, would not have been there. Um, I did totally over prepare. I had to fly through some of the slides. I was super nervous and I was, you know, in my apartment. So it was like all of the nerves were just concentrated on my couch, which was a lot. Um, and then immediately after, you know, it was nice to do kind of the virtual toast. And then I took like a four hour nap. I just passed out because I couldn't sleep the day before and I was super nervous. Um, but you know, I think what was helpful for me was to actually write out literally like a script what I was going to say. And I'm a little bit corny and kind of a dork. And so I even wrote in my jokes into the script, like the moments when I was like, I'm gonna try to make them laugh. It was right in there. The moments I wrote like next slide so that I knew when to change the slides and you know, designed that right into uh, my PowerPoint. And then my PowerPoint itself, I went through it a few times beforehand. Um, and made sure that the visuals match what I was trying to do and what I was trying to say. And so, you know, I got good feedback. There is a recording of my defense that exists, which I think is also different. Like I now have this Zoom recording and, a, and I saved the transcript of the chat, which I have as kind of a memorial to, to what I did. Um, and, you know, I, all things considered, as far as defenses of PhDs go, I found mine to be, you know, powerful and good. And I'm glad it happened the way that it did. Um, so. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for that. I, you know, I, I didn't even think about the fact that you do get this recording and you get to cast this wide net of folks who can come. Um, so thank you for that. I will add for the good of the order in my proposal defense, I cried. So I think it's okay to cry. Yes. And I cried on the first slide though. So I oh, don't yeah. actually yeah. know what was happening, but it was just like, I felt like I was there and I, and and I was like, Lord have mercy, let me get this together for y'all. And then my poor committee, they all turned their screens off. They're like, we're gonna make this easy for you. You don't have to look at us. But I just wanna say for the good of the order, if you cry, you cry, it's fine. I still pass, didn't have to make any edits, go me. All right, so let's move into the job market and postdoc type of things. So to Pello and Tracy, I really wanna to turn to you because I wanna hear about those organizational methods that you use to keep track of the potentials. Here's the thing, it's like, you're gonna get inundated with all these different sites. Go here to look for fellowships, go here to look for postdocs, go here to look for adjuncts. So what in the midst of like writing this thing and finishing up your dissertation? So I'd love for you to share a little bit about how you kept all that organized and what you did to hold things down. Yeah, of course. So um, I I think you may, maybe you've all heard the joke about people looking at Zillow at night before they go to bed and like scrolling through looking at houses. So I was that way with um, Indeed and LinkedIn on the job board. So I was always looking at jobs at night, kind of scrolling, kind of dreaming about when I graduate and when I'll be done and get my big girl job. So um, that's kind of what I did, honestly. It wasn't the best organizational method, but I would save whatever job stood out to me. And then on the days where I, I focused on looking at the jobs I saved, I made sure to go in, make sure I read through the details. And then 
actually applied to the ones that stood out to me the most. And um, a big thing with LinkedIn, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. Keep your profile current. People will reach out to you. Honestly, um, the job that I actually just accepted a position that, uh, recently to, I pretty much got that because I reached out to someone on LinkedIn um, who was in a position that I eventually want to get to. And she offered me an internship in the assessment department at a medical school. So the past nine months, I've been working remotely there. And um, they were really understanding of the fact that I was doing a dissertation. So that's a big thing too. If you're gonna be working full-time or part-time while you're doing this process, make sure the team you work for is aware of that completely and is super supportive of it. If they're not supportive of it, don't even do that because you might you won't be able to succeed in both areas. But thankfully they were. So I was able to do that. If I was ever really busy, I, I emailed them and said, hey, can I focus on my dissertation today? And they were fine with that. So anyways, um, like I said, LinkedIn kept that current. Don't be afraid to reach out to people and ask for advice. You never know what doors that may open. And yeah, like, honestly, just scroll at night. That's that, that you do it during your downtime. That's fine. <laughs> that was my process. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. And Tracy, did you have an economics type spreadsheet? I feel like you did. I was just going to say, so you always make fun of me for putting stuff in spreadsheets. Um, but my mom reminded me recently that like I used to put my chores in a spreadsheet and I'd write like 10 cents <laughs> for like making my bed. So yeah, I put everything in spreadsheets and that's definitely what I do now. I think the short answer to this question is it's, it's a still an ongoing process. And to, to Pella's point, uh, so when I first started the PhD, I was working full time in insurance and initially they said they were supportive, but they weren't. So uh, I eventually made this decision, which was uh, I actually think one of the worst breakups I've ever had to like leave that job because it was very comfortable. And then I was doing this like part time job hustle, uh, which everybody does in New York. So nobody feels bad for you. But uh, so that eventually so this part time hustle thing. So at the new school, uh, the so we're at the Milano School, which is a policy school, but it's an interdisciplinary program. So our faculty have a foot in the economics department or a foot in the anthropology department. So we get job postings all the time that come through our listserv. And I happened, St. John's was looking for an adjunct and I sent my resume in and they called me the next day. And this was two weeks before the semester started in fall of 2018. And that's how I got the job I have now. Uh, the chair of the department is the best boss I've ever had. Uh, he has two daughters that are like roughly my age. So he like kind of dads me a little, but uh, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> uh, so I, I applied for this. So I'm in a contract role now that re renews every year, but it's non, it's non tenure track. So it's, uh, I kind of have a foot in both worlds. Like I, I have my defense coming up. Is my day to day going to change in the next year? No, but there's also, I, it's, since it's a contract and, it renews for the next four years as long as nothing else happens. So it's it's kind of nice because it's comfortable, but at the same time, it's like, okay, well, I have this Excel sheet of uh, things from the American Economic Association and APAM, but uh, LinkedIn's actually good. I should add that to my my sheet. Uh, and I, I've been updating it and I'm like, oh, I'll get to it after my dissertation, even though a lot of the deadlines are like immediately after the defense. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'll deal with that when I get there. Uh, but yeah, it's for me, Excel sheets keep me organized and I love sharing Excel sheets with other people for like accountability reasons. So it's like, oh, look at this. And yeah, the rest of it is uh, exactly what Tapelo said. It's like networking, even if it's someone whose work you admire or uh, you meet them at a conference. If you meet people at conferences anymore, I guess it's kind of these panels and then you're like, hey, I found you on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me things. Uh, but yeah, because I've more often than not, people in our discipline are willing to help each other. Yeah, and I, I will just um, sort of elevate definitely having having a pulse to the different venues where you can get positions. And if it's if it suits you, put it in a spreadsheet. I will say I, I do put mine in a spreadsheet. I, I tease Tracy, but I have all the due dates there and the different links to the postings. But one thing I, I do want to add is don't feel like you have to try to make yourself fit somewhere. There's a job and a place for you. Um, and if, if you read it and you're like, well, if I change my research like this, and I and maybe that will work. Just be cognizant of the fact that you are making the decision to change your research like this and, and you'll have to make good on that when you potentially get to the place. So I wanna move us into um, 
kind of our final round before we get to our quick tips. And that's all about self-care and mental health. So Sergio, I'm going to go to you first about boundaries. Uh, so what, the way that I wrote this question is obtaining a doctoral level degree is a rigorous endeavor and can be inc an incredibly isolating experience. And anyone who is on this call who knows Sergio know that he got friends on friends on friends, but I, we're just still going to say that it can be for some an incredibly isolating experience. So I would love to hear how you maintain this healthy balance and enforce boundaries as you as you matriculate through so i don't know if it's healthy but mm -hmm. um, i come from a big family uh, i'm mexican and so family's always in your business and when you don't show up to family gatherings or you don't call or you're just not around it's like oh you don't care about us oh you're like you know like you think you're better so and so right you get comments like that and so I think for me, like when I really like started this process and, it, you know, started getting deeper into this um, doctoral process, I, I had to like tell my family, like, I love you and I need to get this done. And there's going to be times that I'm going to be available and there's going to be times where I'm going to be MIA. But I need you to understand that is I'm not doing it, you know, out of emotion. It's like, I just want to make sure I can, you know, get to a certain point. Um, and with that, also give yourself boundaries to not go to the deep end and just be so like intertwined in, in this dissertation and other work, right? Like we, we are more than just our dissertations. We are more than just this like academic label. And so really like setting time, like, so the way that the way I like to work is the way I schedule like meetings, the way I schedule like writing, the way I schedule these things, I also schedule me time. And so, right, and then I'm big on like putting it on like a calendar and color coding it. Like you can see, like I love to color code and say, okay, this means this, this will mean that. But I, I, I love to try to schedule my meantime with like my partner, with like family and stuff. So I'm like, okay, cool. If I know that this deadline is coming, then I need to make moves and get things done by this time because I'm going to be off on Saturday or I'm going to be off on Sunday, right? And understanding that if we, like if we don't take breaks to nurture our souls, then we're not going to be the best we can be when it comes to this academic work, right? And so just really find, and find what works for you. Like I do things where I'm like, okay, today I'm off. I am off the clock. I am not going to work. And I tell my partner, hold me accountable. If you see me like opening up my laptop or checking my email, my phone, check me because I need to like be off and I need to be present. And I think, you know, going through this panorama has really taught us that like we need to be present on what's going on today because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and it's hard right because the academy has this beautiful notion of individualism and only one person gets the golden star and i'm very much about the let's create a bigger table instead of building a wall of like i'm better than you and this is my arena and i'm the expert we're all experts right and so just finding something that works for you and you know like and processing what that guilt is and where it comes from is it you or is it because we've been conditioned to think that we need to be working around the clock in order to get promotion, in order to get tenure, in order to like publish? Like, so I, I try to think about those things. And then, you know, I, 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 again, with people, hold yourself accountable to people in that institution. So, you know, my partner holds me accountable. My family will hold me accountable. They're like, you've been in my for like two months now. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, you know, come through and you need to eat food and you need to just be away from the work so you can go back refreshed. I want to appreciate you for that. And I want to, on behalf of Sergio and myself, we're going to give everybody gold stars. Yeah. <laughs> Sergio, We're just going to give out all the gold stars because I mean, it's so true. Um, just the ways in which sometimes we put, we put too much pressure on ourselves and then we, we kind of, um, try to get this thing that someone else says is great so speaking of which let's move into personal growth to pillow i want to turn to you and i want to hear like there are many lessons that i think people <laughs> learn um during this process about themselves and so i sometimes i just have to tell myself okay okay this is what i'm this is what i'm supposed to get out of this and i will also say tracy whenever i give tracy my bad news she's like it's a process. That's her response to me. So I would love to hear to fellow from you in terms of what you have learned about yourself as a person and a scholar while matriculating through these different phases, particularly during this pandemic. 
Yes, for sure. Um, I kind of want to piggyback off of what Sergio was just saying, uh, not necessarily about myself, but how my value system has changed and how I have learned to, for myself, like value my, especially my family, like my family is everything to me. And during my PhD process, actually, uh, my father got really, really sick at one point. And that kind of opened up my eyes to the fact that like family is all you got. It, you know, for me, it's like that's that's they're my rock. So I, I knew it was important to always make sure that I put them first and I put my dissertation, my PhD second. Um, so I think that was great that Sergio mentioned that. The other thing I, uh, there's three other points I wanted to talk about. Um, one, fail to plan, you plan to fail. <laughs> That's the really famous quote. So my PhD program is very course heavy. And because of that, I was so focused on just passing the courses. I wasn't necessarily thinking too heavily about my actual dissertation topic. Like it was in the back of my mind, but I wasn't preparing for it. I was just like, okay, I have to pass these classes. I have to, um, you know, do my comprehensive exams, but I wasn't as prepared for the dissertation process as I wanted to be. So that made the time between passing comps and my proposal to be a little bit longer than I would have wanted. So I've learned from that after, after I did my proposal, I kind of learned from my lesson and was able to kind of plan ahead for the, the defense. So the time between my proposal and defense has been much, will be much shorter. Um, so definitely learned that lesson. Also learned that I really enjoy hybrid work environments. So although all of us were forced to pretty much work from home, especially in the height of the pandemic, I realized how much I miss being able to go to different spots to study. I have to change where I'm working in order to really thrive. So um, definitely learned that about myself. And I tried to, what I tried to do instead was take myself on long walks. So I, though I only had, was able to work from home, I would just make sure I took like an hour long walk once or sometimes twice a day just to have a space <laughs> between these writing sessions. And then lastly, which has been talked about a lot today is to talk to others about the process. And I talked to colleagues both within your program, but also with outside of your program. And if you have a faculty mentor you could talk to, I think that's awesome too. They can give you their perspective. But I talked to them about both the, the positive things that were occurring and the negative things. And I realized that those are the things that kind of help steer me through this process and, and keep me level-headed. Thank you so much for that. So I, I feel like one thing that you, you you all have elevated a lot, but one thing that we have elevated or you have elevated are all these different parts to this process. And of, in all of these different parts, we are interfacing with lots of different people. And, and you know, some people ain't people people. And some people who your friends in the beginning ain't going to be your friends in the end. So I, I just want to take a beat and a second to talk through it. All of that are in regular terms, but then we did that when, when the world was again going through this thing. So I would love to just take a beat and hear from Bianca and Augusta about the soft skills that you've really acquired and how you've kind of interfaced with um, people, with committee members who have maybe had things happen in their lives and made some shifts. What, what things did you perhaps start doing differently? And how did you, how did you kind of keep yourself managed and sane? So for me, um, in regards to management, you know, everything from time management to relationship management, uh, to managing my self-care, uh, academic uh, responsibilities. I think for me, um, it was interesting because Sergio mentioned and also uh, Tapella mentioned family. And I had to change my verbiage around how I was communicating to family. So instead of saying, like, you know, everyone calling me at nine, 10 o'clock, what are you doing? You know, expectation is watching TV, you're hanging out. I'm like, oh, I'm writing a paper or I'm reading something or, you know, and they're like, why are you still doing that? Why are you still doing? And so I had to change my verbiage around uh, the contents of what I shared. So instead of saying, I have to, I said, I get to, I really want to do this. <laughs> I had to change that framework, that conversation. Um, and what I've done um, to also put myself in a better position is also place or, or invite people who are like two or three steps ahead of me um, and also on the same path. Um, so somebody who's actually in the same program, um, serendipitously, uh, I was in, in my first my first semester of school. Um, I ended up being in a project with three other ladies. We created a Slack team to, to like communicate, uh, a Slack channel to communicate. And for some reason that cohort, like that, that specific group of 
uh, women that we've been working with has con continued to just be beneficial along the way. Um, so that is a great way to be, you know, just manage the relationships and help me to stay accountable. And even just gaps in knowledge where I'm like, what's going on? How do I do this? You know, um, another thing I wanted to share is um, I mentioned Slack, but communication tools, you know, like Google Drive and Google Suite is like the best. You have Google calendars, you have Google Docs that you can share information with. Um, having been on different boards and committees, um, one good practice that I've benefited from is that we always have agendas and we always have action steps. And so even, you know, meeting with, um, with others, like recently I had a meeting with my chair and I'm like, okay, this is the agenda. This is what we're going to talk about. I'm letting you know in advance, you have editing permission. So whatever you'd like to add in, let me know. Um, uh, let me know. Uh, and then at the end, it's like, okay, this is the next step. This is what I'm accountable. This is what you're accountable for. Um, it just makes the process much smoother. And so I put some of those practices. So anything, so from relationship management to just management communication and, and uh, projects. Um, and when I say projects, of course, I'm talking about school. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just been helpful to use all those different tools. I, I, I echo all of, of what Bianca just shared. And I think a lot of what I learned as soft skills also resonate with uh, what Sergio shared earlier about self-care and making sure to prioritize that and seeing those as skills that you're developing just as a professional, right? Like these are habits that you're establishing. Um, one of those, one of the things that I really did learn, particularly when everything transitioned to virtual, is to meet folks where they are, and that includes also their comfort with a variety of these different kind of virtual tools. So one, my committee chair is a texter. She prefers texting to email, which was, you know, what we did, right? Then I was texting her and kind of checking up, and then we would have regular phone calls. Um, another person on my committee uh, was actually on a sabbatical year. Uh, last year and so we were doing a lot of zoom calls while they were on the other side of the planet um, and trying to you know track them down as they were kind of moving around but we scheduled zoom calls and that person was a uh, particularly passionate about about the craft of writing and so that was the one person on my committee who was giving me basically line edits right on my chapter drafts versus other folks who were giving me more idea edits right and kind of more uh higher level or you know more theoretical kind of uh feedback and then one of the folks on my committee was just super busy she, you know like famous academic right like a lot going on and when things transitioned to zoom and when black lives matter was happening she's a major scholar in african-american literature so black lives matter is still happening black lives still matter uh when the movement kind of reached its peak visibility last year. Uh, she was one of the folks that was constantly being called to do a lot of events. And so sending her things to read ahead of time was not gonna work. So for her, and she was the one who was really focusing on my job market stuff as well, we would sit on Zoom and she would literally use that time to work with me, right? And literally go line by line live. And so just learning what are the different folks, right? What are the different approaches that you can use for your committee members? What are their styles, their working styles? And also what are their strengths, right? What do they actually bring to the whole committee, to the committee as a whole was super important. Um, and then the tools, as Bianca said, to help manage time. I'm a huge fan of the Forest app uh, that you can use to do Pomodoros, right? So chunks of time where you're actively working and then a break and you can time it. And there's a little bit of an incentive because you're growing a tree and you can build a tree with other folks and your tree dies and the trees are cute and right. So all of that really helped make it make, you know, make me establish a routine, but also I realized that I needed that kind of structure and a timer that literally locks my phone so I can't open Twitter um, and, mm -hmm. you know, allows me to kind of get to writing. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. I love the way that you guys have dropped all these gems throughout the entire conversation. But I, I feel like we, well, one thing I feel like I have to say, based in my own experience for the good of the order, Google is great, but it was not great for me when I had to reformat. So I don't, that was my experience. Yeah. Now, other people may have had different experience, but I will say Google was awesome when I got to see when people read my things and when they gave comments. But then when I had to download that thing to put it in a different format, I kicked myself for, for Google. So just, you know, thoroughly vet your pieces because there are two sides to the coin. But we also kind of talked about this notion of managing up. And I know this is, I'm, I'm about to go off script, y'all. So I'm sorry for that. But I, I, can we take just two seconds to talk through, we've talked about committees and we've heard that some committees have iterated a bit. 
Can you give folks some insight on some of the intentionality that you thought through when approaching people and having the conversation of them sitting on your committee? I feel like that's kind of like the tribe question, but it's a little more around a committee. And I think it might be useful for folks to hear. If anyone wants to jump in. I'll be a little messy and say, uh... <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> Share the mess. <laughs> yes, know the politics. I was very naive about my program's politics, that's all I'm going to say, and I had a couple of friends tell me, like, you can't have these people on your committee, otherwise you'll never graduate. So if you need to talk to someone who's already graduated to see who doesn't like who, so you know who's on your committee, that's what I would tell you. That's my little tea for the day. <laughs> and to, to add to, to, you know, to add to the messiness, um, my school has and doesn't have written policies because they're just crazy. And so I, I asked my, my advisor who I knew was like the only person I really wanted to like work with in my department per se. And so I was like, okay, who do you work well with in the department? Because I don't want drama. I don't want anything to like ricochet and come to me when I'm dealing with trying to get this done. But that's also like the kind of relationship I have with um with my chair right where I was like was able to like really ask like who would you work well with as opposed to me choosing a faculty who you might like not vibe with too well and this is unfortunate this is the reality of higher ed I don't know how it is in other departments but the higher you go it's like the more they act out and you're like are you for real and so yeah. you see things like that and so I had I had like a very like concrete conversation to understand the expectations um, I have two outsiders on my committee right um, and I, I highly encourage folks, find someone who's going to be your cheerleader, whoever in your committee is going to be like, you got this, we're going to make this happen. The one person you can be a hot ass mess and cry to the person you can text if you need to and say, I don't know if this is going to happen anymore. Like someone on your committee, at least for me, cause I'm very, I'm a Pisces, so I can be a little needy and I need some love sometimes. And so... <laughs> Dr. Anita Revilla is like, Anita is the, is my cheerleader. I can text Anita and Anita will be like, you're going to do, you're going to do fine. You got this. Right. And just having people that'll give you that, if that's what you need, right. Understand your needs and what's going to help you glow and grow in this space, as mm -hmm. opposed to like, this is what I have to do. And like, no one's like trying to understand me. Right. And know who to go to for what. Um, I know that, uh, like the way we were, they were discussing right now, right? It was like, oh, this person, Augusta was talking about how this person gave me this kind of feedback. So I knew to ask this from this person. Yeah. This person gave me this kind of feedback and then understand the, the way the, the rules are in your department. So I know at the end of the day, my chair has the final say. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as my chair is down with whatever it is I'm submitting, the other committee members can totally like provide feedback. But if my chair says no, then that's a no, period. Like understand like that's just how it works. There's no like, well, this person said like, that's cute, but I'm the chair and I said this, so that's just that. And move on. <laughs> Facts. But that. also use that to your advantage, I will say. Right. My situation is the same way. And I'm like, well, you know, my chair, I, I'm gonna, I have to run this by the chair. Um, but one other thing I want to add really quickly is that sometimes based on uh, university policies, you, you, you have to either use a whole bunch of folks who are at that particular university, or maybe yeah. you don't have the luxury of getting too many folks who are outside. Just because people aren't on your committee doesn't mean they can't be part of your tribe. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to shout out Mary Beth Gassman, who um, serves as, I don't even know her fancy title. This woman, she serves as everything um, out of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute. I, it's not executive director, something bossier and better and more <laughs> awesome than that. But we were fortunate enough, um, us visiting scholars to interface with her and she, although she has like zero time she always makes time for us and sometimes you got to go where the love is to yeah. get some of those needs met so I just want to kind of throw that out and add that in so we are in our final round folks and we're just we're a few minutes over but we're gonna make it happen we're gonna make it happen and this is our last round of giving quick tips what are the things if you had one thing to share with the folks on this call to make their doctoral journeys better or, or one or two things what would those things be and let, let me call on us so I don't lose any time. Let us start with Tracer. Let me start with you, my dear. Um, I think the community aspect's been the most important for me because uh, I know a lot of people go back and forth or whether or not they're going to finish. I've never had a doubt that I was going to finish. I just, 
didn't know I was going to take this long, but uh, I would say the community, not only like committee members, like I also have someone on my committee that I can like text at random hours and just say like, uh, am I doing the right thing here? Like what's happening? Uh, so I think for me, it's build a community of not only people in your cohort or in the student community, but also build relationships, academic relationships. And again, the person that I text is not a new school person. So it's just whoever is, like Sergio said, is gonna be your cheerleader. Awesome, thank you. So find a cheerleader. I will also say I had one job and I blew it. I was supposed to say, the chat is now open for questions. So as we're getting these final thoughts, please submit your questions into the chat. I blew it, you guys. Darn. But all right, let's move to Bianca. You want to go next? Yes. Yeah, so definitely community, like Tracy mentioned. But I think also remember your why and don't be afraid to be different. I feel like a lot of times, especially like in research and academia, you kind of kind of want to you can get tempted to conform. But the difference that you bring that you maybe don't see could be the difference that's needed. And so don't shy away from being who you authentically are because who you authentically are really could be um, a benefit to others. Thank you. All right, let's go to, Dr. Agassi, I'm gonna come to you last. So let's go to, to hello. <laughs> yes, I will just say uh, you are in your own race. Uh, I'm in a cohort where some people have graduated before me, some people are gonna be there after I'm done. Focus on yourself. Put your blinders on when it comes to your journey. Don't worry about everybody else. You are in your own race. That's my my little thing. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for that, Sergio. This is a this is a good one. I think. I mean, I, with the community thing, um, if if anybody follows me on any kind of like social media, I always talk about the scholar homies, my PhD crew, and my scholar sisters. And like these are like different spaces and places where we come together and like a we like we praise and give each other flowers for like the hard work that we're doing. B support each other, right? Like on our soundboard. So this is what my thought is. Like, how can I take this thought and conceptualize it into like a manuscript? Or like, how does I get this thought and how does it become my like chapter, whatever? Um, right? Find those spaces and. And I, I don't know if it wasn't for this panorama, I don't know that that would have happened, if that makes any sense. Because the moment it was like, well, we can connect through like a virtual Zoom, all of a sudden I started meeting people in other places and spaces that weren't necessarily in my program that were like, I'm down to me, I'm down to like work on this and we can like try to figure this out together, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's part of it is like being, be willing to be vulnerable and put yourself out there, right? Because it's hard and it's scary and you don't know if you can like trust people. And I come, I grew up in the hood where like, we don't trust people. That's just like a, a natural instinct. And you gotta be, you know, like I gotta put myself out there. If I don't put myself out there, I'm gonna lose. Like the if I don't take a chance, I'll never know. And so put yourself out there. Thank you so much, Dr. Augusta. I'm gonna jump in because I'm gonna let you have the final word because you finished some things. Um, but I got a list. I got a list, friends. First, I, I want to elevate what um, Dr. Augusta has said, save everything. When I submitted things, I submitted things version one, version two. Part of me was trying to be a little bit messy. Like, I just need you to see that I'm on version 13. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then also it was like, I also want you to know that version 13 was the same as version two. And I don't know why you know this, but you somehow <laughs> love version 13. But anyway, <laughs> um, I would just definitely say save everything. And your brain will actually remember where you wrote those things in those different versions because you go back to it our writing is so iterative and, and there's always ways to change out words and make it better so save those things as different versions so that you have them secondly i'm going to say um zotero for the win if you don't know now you know get your friends get your friends friends tell your friends that you should start from day one in your courses of dropping those pieces into the zotero and use the magic stick because it saves you i don't even know if that's what it's called for real but that's what i use um, but it saves you so much time and akin to zotero if you're a qualitative person if you endeavor to like play around with qualitative softwares i software i waited until um, my proposal phase to really get into using the qualitative software and i could have used them for like lit reviews but um the downside to that is that i was trying to learn all of these different 
software as I was trying to write the proposal. And I think it took a little more time and I wished that I had played around with things while I was in my coursework um, because I feel like it could have saved me some, some additional time. Um, I, last thing, and I promise this is the last thing. And then my last thing is like, you, you got to find a friend who is a little bit ahead of you, who can tell you what I just said about that Zotero, but some, talk to folks who are in different phases, who can tell you their lessons of what they learned. Because again, every university has its own nuances. And to be able to like, for example, go to someone who has already passed their comps and say, how did you organize your notes? And it, it, they're gonna, you know, let people think what they think, it doesn't matter. But just to say to someone, today's my first day, but how did you organize your notes when it was time for you to study for the comps will really help kind of frame the work that you do. And it might end up being a time saver for you. So um, I will I will stop with those because I said one and then I did eighteen. I broke mm -hmm. rules. I'm sorry, but that's why doctor. That's why you finished Doctor Augusta and I didn't because I clearly can't say no and I be breaking the rules. So Doctor Augusta, I want to turn to you for some final thoughts. It doesn't get any better as you get to the end. It does not get any better as you, and it keeps going when you're a postdoc too. You start saying yes to everything. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few. I do want to lift up. Find your people and find your people outside of academia to get that perspective. You need the perspective of why you're doing it, why you're writing the way you're writing, make sure that it's legible to folks all across all kinds of boards. Um, Cause the work that we do, particularly if you're a student, if you're a person of color, you know, we're bringing all kinds of people with us and to us, right? And so carry that in the way that you write and how you're connecting with folks. Um, one other tool that I would recommend is Scrivener. If you all haven't used that, it's a tool that's designed for writers. And so it's not as kind of linear as Google Docs or Microsoft Word, but allows you to kind of write in pieces and then you can pull things together into a final document. Um, and it's a great, it's a really fantastic tool that you can use. Um, and then I think I would say find a non-academic hobby. Again, kind of part of that perspective, there's a way, particularly when you're dissertating, that it takes over your life, right? All of the time and you're just constantly thinking about this thing. Um, so, you know, like crochet, right? I manage a Discord for academics who watch trash TV. So sometimes we're sitting together on Discord watching like Bachelor in Paradise live, right? But all of these things help get, you know, like you need to sometimes come out of your PhD, come out of your dissertation. And, you know, you never know. Whatever's happening on the beach at Bachelor in Paradise, sometimes I'm like, ah, this is inspiring something that will come back into <laughs> what I'm writing. Um, and then, you know, the end, and you're gonna hear this a lot and it's gonna be really annoying and then it's gonna be true when you do finish. A good dissertation is a done dissertation. It's not your magnum opus, it's not your life's work. It is the thing that you do to graduate from your PhD program, right? And it does not have to be perfect. Uh, mine is definitely not perfect, but I defended with no edits and it is, uh, it is embargoed and I will continue to embargo it <laughs> until at least the book comes out so that I have something else, right? That folks can read first before they get the dissertation, but finish it. You know what I mean? Like just do the thing, finish it, defend it, and then let it sit for a little bit before you come back to it. And you will, uh, you know, you all, we know why we're doing the PhD. And as Bianca said, like, know your why. Um, and I would just say, allow that to be the, the, the motivator to get to the end of the dissertation so that you can get to the work that you want to do beyond that. That's why I left you for the end, Dr. Augusta. I knew that you were going to drop some gems. And I, I, I just want to rearticulate that that saying is so annoying. It in is. The beginning. And you even tell yourself, no, that's for people who aren't great. And I'm great. And this is going yes. to be perfect. And it's you, you'll come to find your own writing process. But it's like it, what she said. She said what she said. Mic drop. <laughs> so I would love to um, open us up or turn it over to you, Natalie, or let, let's talk through how we're, let's get some questions. What questions folks have in the chat. Thank you all so much for, for sticking through with us. But now let's hear what questions you have for us. Oh, we have a handful of questions, so don't worry. <laughs> um, someone asks, um, first I say thank you for sharing your experiences, everyone. Um, I'm wondering what advice you have for walking with others through this process. For instance, I have friends who are also dissertating, proposing, etc. Um, and sometimes it feels difficult to help each other when we all seem to be struggling. Like all of us are shaking our heads. I don't know, friends, who has it on their heart to, to tackle this one? Sergio, all right. Um, 
so in I was actually just thinking about this right in my so my PhD crew there's four of us and we're all in the same program same department we have the same advisor and chair like we're in we're, we're like a, a posse right so the way it's worked which has been beautiful at my school the way it works is when you defend your proposal it's like it's not open to the public so what we did was each of us so first my friend Monica started and asked our chair is it okay if my PhD crew comes to watch? We're all students, we're all your students. And she was like, yeah, that's fine. So Monica did it, passed. No, Crystal did it. Crystal did it, passed. We all sat there. We were like, yeah, right. Like all inside that we made sure we weren't visible on the screen either. Not to you know, so like not mess with the flow. And then Crystal did it. Then I did it and I did the same thing. And I asked, can like the PhD crew come, right? And then Monica did it and Monica did the same thing. So we have like one more person in our group, um, Janelle and Janelle's gonna propose this semester. And it's like, friend, like you're right there. Like, and we're all gonna be there like blank screen but we're gonna be right there with you. And so that I think has been like a really beautiful part. That's not like super common, right? Um, but I've been able to find that sense of like comunidad, like we're all in this together. You just saw me defend, friend. Like it's it's right there. Like you can do it too if you just saw me go through this process and like put it together and like all that. So, so hopefully that answered and helped. <laughs> I'll, I'll also add, you'll find friends too. You'll find um, and there's benefit. If sometimes you got to give yourself grace and time, but there's benefit to to reading an economist's work. I, I, that's not my thing, but I do learn some things from reading Tracy's stuff <laughs> and, I, and you find new friends who have nothing to do with your discipline. I'm sorry, Tapello, were you about to say something? Oh, no, 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 I'll just shake oh. my head. My head. <laughs> Anyone else before we move to the next question? Yeah, I might I just mean, add. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I just real quickly, we're just going to say, I think it's super important for us all to be in therapy. Um, and one of and my, my therapist that I had through a lot of the time that I was a PhD student specialized in helping PhD students. And she at one point had like groups for folks who are PhD students. And so just kind of a real tangible, you know, and there are a lot of online tools now, particularly with the pandemic that allow folks to, to find folks that are not necessarily where you are physically. Um, so we have a little bit more free leeway to find someone who can actually be helpful on all kinds of fronts. Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank I would you. just add, which I wish I would have added earlier. I just thought of it now. Uh, learn what kind of learner you are, right? Because we're all experts in our field, but I am still learning what kind of learner I am. I think why for me, research and writing are the same is because I'm a learn by doing person. And I only learned this stuff because Tanisha has been a teacher, a superintendent of school districts for like 20 years. And I'm like, I didn't know there were different learning styles. And right. she told me all about it. and. I think for the person that asked that question, recognize everybody learns a little bit differently. So maybe uh, for one person in the group, like let's set a calendar invite for the same time every day. And if people can be there, cool. Like the people that are very structured. And if there's some people that uh, just like, oh, I just, I mean, for me, as an example, I had a nine to five job. I never want to do that again. Uh, I, 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 I like doing things at different times of the day. Uh, so I would just say, I mean, you can set up some sort of strict guidelines for everybody in your group and find out what works for you if you want to share writing once a week, whatever it is. Uh, but then also learn about yourself and the kind of learner you are and don't try not to get sucked into too many things that aren't helpful for your time. Tracy, what you're not going to do is tell people how old I am inadvertently. I started working when I was <laughs> two. <laughs> That's what you're not going to do. Natalie, I said, I said two years of teaching, right? Two. <laughs> you said 20. But it's okay. I started when I was two. Natalie. That's right. Um, someone else asks, uh, what advice do you have for choosing your committee? What do you wish you could have done differently when choosing a committee or chair? I mean, I will say, I think... Sometimes the person who is the most obvious choice is not the best fit, uh, whether that's personality wise, whether that's time commitment wise, whether that's even specialty wise. Um, nobody on my committee does exactly what I do. And actually that worked, right? And it allowed them to get um, perspective and allowed them to push me to be more interdisciplinary um, 
than I probably would have if I had come in doing the thing exactly the way, right? My, you know, the, anybody else does it. So I would say, I mean, I think the, the major advice is that make sure these are the folks that you get along with on your committee. Make sure they're folks that are well read enough in your field that they can give you, you know, useful feedback, but they don't need to be, you don't need to be an exact replica of them. Um, and then kind of, as we said earlier, make sure that you're clear about what are the functions that each folk, that each person is serving on your committee. So I would highly, highly, highly advise having at least one person who is thoughtful about writing as a craft and can help you develop as a writer. I agree and echo with all of that. I, I maybe went, I tried to go too far with like, oh, I'm going to get the person who is like masterful at qualitative, then I'm going to get the anthropologist, then I'm going to get the economist, then I'm going to get the other social social scientists and psychologists, because ultimately, I want to be all these things. And initially, it was like, well, you should do this with your work and this with your work. And then I was like, oh, God, oh, God. But then luckily enough, my chair stepped in and said, here's what you're going to do with your work. <laughs> and then I was able to say this is what he said. Um, but yeah, definitely thinking through like how you could benefit from those folks. And it's also I, I don't think that when I went into my PhD program, I knew that that we had to carry that work. I don't know what I thought. I just thought magically this committee would kind of um, reveal itself to me. Mm -hmm. But from the day that you step on campus, like you can pay attention to who's in your classes, or who's leading your classes, like whose work resonates with you and you can see how people move. And that I think that totally also can give some insight. I think um, for me, so I think A, like, I'm big on like, this is what I dream about. This is what I want, right? And don't like, don't limit yourself because you never know because I ended up getting two committee members that are outside, right? And technically I was only supposed to have one outsider. Um, but because like, you know, long story short because one of the committee members is like a well-known person. Um, I, told, <laughs> I told my advisor, they're not willing to be on the committee if the other person isn't going to be on the committee. And I need both of them, like understand like what they can bring to the table, right? Um, I, as it was just mentioned beautifully, um, but also like, how are you building authentic relationships with these people? Because I'm very much so that like, this is a, this is a, a, a big part of my life, right? Like how I'm coming into this space, how I'm coming into this work. And so my expectation or my goal is like, I don't want this to be like, yeah, you were there for me. You worked with me during my dissertation and I never saw you again. No, I plan to continue to have relationships that are a lot like life lasts, you know, like will last my whole life, however long that may be. And um, it's not going to be, not everyone's going to be about it, but that's where I was very selective of like, this person I know is going to be around after, right? And I'm like, what am I also bringing to the table? So not, not really thinking that like, oh, I'm only here to learn but also like, actually, I also wanna challenge you and I think I could bring this to the table, which is how I actually got a committee member. Cause I said, I think you do amazing work, but I think I can bring X, Y, and Z based on my perspective. And I would love for you to be on my committee. And they were like, oh, if you have this other person, I'm totally down and I wanna work with you too, right? So it was like, I kind of flipped it, and, you know, in like a very like awkward way, but it worked out, right? It's like, you never know and ask because you never know. So I that's how- I Sergio got game. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you, Sergio got game. <laughs> it just worked. Don't limit yourself because you never know. The worst they can do is say no. Other questions, Natalie? Oh, yeah. Um, so we have a few questions surrounding, um, you know, motivation and what keeps you going. Um, but there is this one about... Um, how helpful were programs and organizations like the National Center for Faculty Diversity Development in helping motivate you in this journey and process? Any other organizations? Do you recommend any professional resources, anything like that? I will definitely say the Visiting Scholars Program <laughs> with um, Mary Beth Gassman has been like the most valuable experience. Um, being able to connect with everyone here um, and really, um, I don't know, it's just been so beneficial in creating that space. And I think in addition to the um, different events and programs, um, being keeping abreast with those um, has been extremely uh, beneficial. And at least for me, um, coming from a background of not knowing what this is supposed to look like and what, uh, what to expect, how to navigate, 
um, it's just been extremely beneficial. Mm -hmm. I'll shout out um, for me, especially when I first got into grad school, the Society of Black Graduate and Professional Students, so uh, BGAP. I joined that organization. They had like a, a one specific for the University of Iowa. A lot of campuses have that, and that. I mean, it was just invaluable to me to be surrounded by students who looked like me, especially being in a state like Iowa. Um, so we sought each other out and we, we became like a family. And I've met, honestly, no one in that program or in the um, in BGAPs was in my program. So it was cool to have friends from just all across <laughs> the university. And they really, we pushed each other. We had study sessions. We had get togethers for fun. It was, it was great and I really needed it. And still great friends with these people. Some of them were in my wedding, like lifelong friendships. <laughs> I think for me, um, so I guess like the, the key thing is like, like network, right? And don't just like, don't just pigeonhole yourself to like, I can only be in this one aspect of academia, right? Like I, I'm getting a degree in higher education and student affairs, but I'm also like, I can market myself in, as, as an interdisciplinary scholar and go into other realms, right? Like ethnic studies and stuff based on the work that I do. So like one group that has been like a saving grace for me has been AHAS, which is the Association of Hoteria Arts, Activism and Scholarship. And that's why I saw a lot of people that do like queer of color work and like that's not just academic, but community, right? But in other aspects of like society. And so being able to just be in that space and A, feel seen, the way Tapella was just, you know, like, I, I feel seen, right? Like, I see somebody else at another place that is going through something similar because there aren't resources to really support our intersecting identities and aspects of ourselves because they just, they, they don't have those tools, right? And so understanding that, understanding that resources aren't always going to be there and a lot of times they're not there. And so being okay with, like, let me find it elsewhere because that's, that's what community is about, right? Like you're gonna find it elsewhere. Like no one mentor is going to be everything. And I think we also get conditioned to believe that like, well, you're my chair. You're supposed to be like God or Jesus or whoever you believe in. And you're supposed to give me the answer. Cause I can tell you right now, my dissertation chair, she's learning about Hoteria as I'm writing about it. So I have someone on my committee that theorizes and does this work. And my chair is like, I'm here to learn with you. So I might not be the expert in this, but I'm here to show you like the way to make sure we get this done and get you a job. Yeah, and I'll just echo, don't discount the value of those professional organizations and ask folks like what professional organization do you belong to? I can say um, in our interdisciplinary program, the educators are few and far in between. But when I found AERA, like it's a lot of emails, but I, I have also just been linked into a lot of opportunities that I don't think I, I wouldn't have found in my own little bubble in my own little silo. And because my chair is an economist, uh, I can't get away from him, right? Because my chair is an economist, he certainly wouldn't have been able to um, give me that information. But Natalie, more questions, my dear. Just one more question. I think that's all we have time for. Um, I just want to ask, where can everyone find you all? Um, can we do a little a little shout out uh, social media platforms? Sure. Who wants to go first? All right, you can find me at. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, so my first name and my middle name. So on Twitter, on don't I don't use Instagram, but um, also on LinkedIn, I should say I am Tanisha W T A N I S H I A w but then on all the other social media platforms it's at tanishia levette so t-a-n-i-s-h-i-a-l-a-b-e-t-t-e -T -T -E. Ooh, that was long but i'll drop it in the chat and now they will share it out with you guys i'll put mine in the chat too i'm i'm really only on twitter and it's again it's similar uh my first and my middle name so at augusta tinuka i am on linkedin I kind of hate LinkedIn, so I sign in like once every six months. So you can <laughs> add me there and eventually I will accept the request, but I'll put my Twitter in the chat. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So uh, my first name is Apello and then middle name Luby. So that I also had the same, uh, my maiden name was the same as your friend Tanisha and then Whitfield. So that's where I'm pretty active. <laughs> And I am probably the only one who does not have any social media handles. Uh, but if you go to the Proctor Institute website and you search 
Bianca Neal, you will find my name and some information about me. <laughs> because Bianca, Bianca is bomb. You will find a Brazilian podcast um, hosted by Bianca because she is amazing, but we can't get her to get a Twitter, but we are working on it. But I guess then I will say we are almost at, at time. I would like to first and foremost thank our amazing panelists. Thank you for sharing your truth. Thank you for sharing your stories. Thank you for being so open and so willing and giving to um, share some insights. I would also like to thank everyone who showed up. You could be anywhere in this world and you are here with us and we are so very appreciative of it. Happy to connect with you via those social media platformy things. That's another thing you got to try to figure out as you move into academia, whether you love it or you hate it, but you could just be Bianca and be bomb and sprinkle the world with podcasts every now and again, and don't let people find you afterwards. Um, <laughs> I would also <laughs> like to take an opportunity to thank Natalie and Michelle and Brandy staff at Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute, because they put up with all of our mess. I don't know if you heard my dog, but they, they got us covered. Um, so thank Thank you all so much for taking time this evening to work all the tech. And of course, thank you to Mary Beth Gassman. I how come I still don't know this woman's title? She's everything though. And she has a new fancy title. Can somebody just tell me the title so I can do this properly? Are all of us like, we don't know. She's just our everything. She, she is, is our the executive director. <laughs> oh, I did get it right. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so she is in fact the executive director of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute <laughs> and she is every part of amazing and encouraging. So thank you so much, Mary Beth, for being so amazing and for those dimples that you have. And a few other announcements. If you like part one, you should check us out with part two. We'll have a different set of scholars with slightly different stories to share and that will be held next Thursday, same time, starting at six o'clock. And you can absolutely follow the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice on all social media platforms because there are tons of events from how to write op-eds to how to work with folks once you matriculate into your first position to how to get your first position. They are always putting out amazingly good stuff and calls for submissions. So please, please, please follow. Thank you again and have an amazing evening.